Good morning. Um, it's right about 10. Can you guys hear me okay? A little bit louder. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I think we'll go ahead and get started. I don't know if Paula was coming, but um, good morning. Um, my name is Martha McMillan. Um, I'm a zoology preparator here at DMNS. I use um, she, her pronouns. And um, in addition to being a zoology preparator, or the reason I'm a zoology preparator, is because I am an anatomist. Um, so I wanted to come here today. I'm not going to be presenting research, um, but um, kind of a comparative anatomy look at some of, the sp um, some of the species and specimens that we have in our collection and how we can tell um, a different function in different species based on their bones, um, specifically of the shoulder. So uh, a little bit about me. Um, I grew up wanting to be a veterinarian, and so when I graduated high school, I went to this fine institution, and I got a bachelor's degree in veterinary science. Um, along the way, I broadened um, what I was interested in and became very interested in pathology as a subject, which um, has a lot of anatomy kind of within it. So that was kind of a spark in undergrad. Um, I came back north to this fine institution to uh, try and get into vet school. Um, I never got into vet school, but along the way, I uh, discovered a master's program in anatomy. And uh, before I started the program, it was just kind of a like, oh, this would be cool. And the more I got into it, the more I really discovered that this is truly my passion, and I'm a giant nerd for it. Um, and so, yeah, so I ended up with a master's. Um, the technical is uh, biomedical sciences, which is just a fancy way of saying animal anatomy and physiology. Uh, but it is in quadruped um, anatomy and physiology, not humans. Um, and then I ended up at this fine institution as a volunteer. I started in 2014. I had no idea uh, that the zoology department existed, that um, preparation was a thing, and quickly fell in love with it. Um, it's really quite perfect for an anatomist like me. Um, and so yeah, started in 2014. This past February, I uh, was lucky enough to join staff full time. and so. Now I get to be an anatomist every day. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so what uh, really inspired me to give this talk was all of our dioramas that we have. Uh, we have they're kind of central to the museum. They're always my favorite part of the museum. And they've got such a wide variety of species. I thought it would be kind of cool to walk around and check out what we have and then do um, kind of a comparative anatomy look at them. Um, so before we get started with the actual bones, we've got to talk vocabulary. Anatomy relies very, very heavily on what things are named and where they are located. Um, so directional terms are really, really important. So this is a human um, shoulder, not, not a quadruped, obviously. Um, the humerus, the scapula, and the clavicle. Um, and the first kind of the very basic set of terms is anterior and posterior. Anterior for the front, posterior for the back. Um, I really don't like these terms, partially because I was trained as an animal anatomist, but um, I can't keep them straight in my head. And I'll show you my, my preferred ones here in a little bit, but front and back. Um, the next set are medial and lateral. Medial meaning more towards the midline, not right on, but, but more towards the midline. Lateral being more um, towards the outside of the body. And then on the limbs specifically, we talk about proximal and distal. So proximal being up closer to the, the trunk of the body and distal being further down on the limb. Um, and then cranial and caudal, cranial being up towards the head, caudal being towards the tail. Cranial and caudal can also be used um, to refer to the front and the back. Like if you have just one structure that you're holding, the cranial side is the front and the caudal side is the back. Um, so going back to one of our coyote friends, um, these are my preferred terms, dorsal and ventral. Um, I feel like they're a lot easier to, to remember. Um, we don't use them in humans because we walk upright. But dorsal um, being the back, dorsal fin is a really easy way to remember that, ventral being the belly. Um, proximal and distal also apply to the limbs, and then cranial and caudal toward the head and toward the tail. So um, we'll go over some of, some of the specific um, names. There's a lot. Like these look like really simple bones. There's a ton on here that has its own name. Um, anatomists really love to give names to every little bump and, and nook and cranny. 
Um, this is the humerus of Canis latrans, a coyote. This is the humerus of Equus grevii, um, a grevy zebra. Um, I'm showing these because when you learn veterinary anatomy, you really start with the dog. That's the basis. Um, most of the textbooks have primarily a dog, and then it expands into large animal veterinary or large animal anatomy with horses and often cows as well. Um, so, very basic: the head, which is the part that articulates with the shoulder or with the scapula, sorry, to make the shoulder joint. The greater tubercle is. Um, Tubercle refers to kind of a bump on the bone. The greater tubercle is what um, forms the point of the shoulder, which I'll point out here in a little bit. Um, and it's what the biceps brachii, the tendon of that, is going to run over top of that. The condyle is the very end of the bone. It's the entirety of this. All of these other little structures in here have their own names, but I won't go into them. Um, but the condyle is the articulating surface for the uh, elbow joint. You can see it's pretty smooth. It's easier to see on this one. Um, it's really pretty smooth. This is where it's going to be rubbing up against the radius and the ulna. And then the star of our show is the deltoid tuberosity. Um, tu oh, wait. There we go. Um, tuberosity is yet another term for a bump on a bone. Um, and you can see it's a little bit easier to see on the horse, but this is kind of a, um, a rough bump that comes off the side of the bone, um, and it's called the deltoid tuberosity because the deltoid muscle inserts on it. Um, it's the only muscle that does, so it gets its own name. Um, oh, sorry, I forgot. Uh, this is the cranial side, so this is like the front, if, as if you're looking at the front of the animal. This is the caudal. You can see the deltoid tuberosity often from both um, sides. Um, and the last thing I want to say about it is it is always on the lateral side, so it's always going to be on the outside. Um, so you can tell directionally which, um, which humerus you have uh, by finding the deltoid tuberosity and putting it on the outside. So this one is the right. <laughs> I get my directions mixed up a lot, but this is the right humerus for both of these species. All right, and going back to our human model, um, this is also the right arm. And if we're looking at it from the cranial, you can see this tiny little bump. This is ours. That's all we have for deltoid tuberosity. Um, and we'll get into its function and why ours is so small here in a minute. All right, the scapula. Um, again, cranial and caudal. This is really the only time I'm going to show the backside of the scapula because there's not a lot going on back here. There's one big muscle that covers the entirety of it. Um, it's called the um, subscapularis. Um, but there's not, not a ton that's going to pertain to what we're talking about, but I wanted to show you guys what it looked like. Um, the primary structure on the scapula is called the spine, very aptly named. And um, the other important one is the acromion. So it's this bump at the end of the spine, and notably, the horse does not have one. There's a few species that don't. Um, nobody really knows. I think there's theories why, but um, the horse, the pig, they do not have one. But what they do have is this kind of extra large tuberosity on the spine up higher. Um, the acromion is where the deltoid, one of the spots that the, or the, sorry, the spine and the acromion are the, the sites that the deltoid muscle is going to start from. So they're its origination point. So it's going to come, one head on the dog is going to come off the spine and the other on the acromion. And then it's going to come off of that area on the horse. Um, the other thing to note is the glenoid, which is the actual cup that the head of the humerus is going to articulate with. Okay, so this is what they look like when they're articulated. Again, this is the right, the right hand limb for both of these animals. Um, I made animations for this. Um, going over it again real quick, the spine, the acromion lacking in the horse, the glenoid, which articulates with the head, then um, the greater tubercle, which is going to form the point of that shoulder, um, and then our deltoid tuberosity, which you can see on the lateral side. Um, so the function of the deltoid is to flex the shoulder. So in humans, that looks like this. So the deltoid is that, that big shoulder muscle, um, and it allows us to go up like this. In animals, it allows them to go forward like this, um, to pull the humerus um, forward. Muscles only do one thing, they shorten. Um, and so when, um, when you think about their action, you just need to think about it shortening, and it's going to pull that humerus forward. 
Um, this is what it looks like in the person. This is looking at the back of the right shoulder. Um, so this is that spinous, um, spinous head that comes off the spine, the acromial head right here, and then we have a third head that comes off of our clavicle. Most, uh, yeah, most of the species that I'm gonna show you today don't actually have a clavicle, or if they do, it's this teeny little bone that's just floating around in the muscle that doesn't actually articulate with anything. Our clavicle articulates with our sternum, um, and, um, and we've got that third head of the deltoid. None of these other species are gonna have that. Um, speaking of the clavicle, oh, sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself. So in um, the dog and the horse, um, like I said, there's gonna be one, one head of the muscle that comes off the spine, one off the acromion, um, and they're gonna come together at the deltoid tuberosity, and in the horse, there's just gonna be one big belly that crosses that joint. Okay, um, speaking of the clavicle, this gets me to one of my extra credit um, vocabularies. This literally was an extra credit question on an exam for me. Um, it's one of my favorite anatomical terms. I don't know why, it just is. So, um, because our clavicle articulates with our sternum, if you want to remove the upper limb from a human, you have to cut a bone and, or any other primates. Um, in a horse, a dog, a cat, a pig, you can remove the, fore, the forelimb completely without cutting bone at all. The muscular attachment between the forelimb and the body trunk is 100% muscle, and there's a special name for that because anatomists. Um, it is called a sin sarcosis, which means sarcosis referring to muscle, sin referring to together, sin sarcosis, muscular joint. It's just a great word. I don't know why I like it so much. All right. <laughs> so um, jumping into the different species. So going back to the coyotes, we'll focus in on this little dude. Um, and I just wanted to point out most of the, the limbs that you see when, when these guys are walking around, these are the, the lower limb bones um, down past the knee and the, sh and the elbow. So on this guy, this is the point of the elbow, and then the humerus is going to run up this way, the point of the shoulder from that greater tubercle, um, and then the scapula is going to run this direction up to Botswana for our zebra. These are actually plain zebra up there. Um, but again, um, this is the point of the shoulder, or sorry, the point of the elbow. Um, the humerus is gonna run this way and then the scapula is gonna run this way. So jumping into other species. Um, some of you guys may be familiar with him. This is bison bison. Um, and he is really, this individual is really special because he is catalog number two in our whole collection. He came to us from Edwin Carter in 1872. Um, he's down in the collection. If you ever have a chance to get down there, um, go say hi to him. He's really neat. Um, this is what the scapula of a bison looks like. Um, it has an acromion. Um, bovids are a little bit funny. They've got this really pointy one that doesn't go all the way down, but they do have an acromion right here. And the other thing I want to point out is the difference between the space in front of, oh, um, in front of the spine super um, spinous and the space behind the spine and for spinous there's a lot more space back here and there is a big muscle that lays on either side so um, when the infraspinatus muscle is bigger that's an indication that because um, as it crosses the shoulder joint it stabilizes the shoulder joint so when it's bigger it's an indication that this animal is large and heavy and needs that shoulder to be really stable so that it can just stand there and maintain its weight um, so you'll see that in a lot of these larger herbivores. Um, this is the humerus, um, and these bones all come from um, catalog um, specimen number 8117. I've got all of the, the catalog. These are all specimens that are in our collection downstairs. Um, so this is the, the humerus, and this is the deltoid tuberosity on this guy. Not quite as um, prominent as on the horse, but you can see it's still fairly prominent and very bumpy, lumpy bumpy, um, which indicates that that's gonna be a pretty strong connection for that bone, or for that muscle to this bone. Um, and it's going to, to be, um, the function of it's gonna be a little bit more important for this animal. Um, do, 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 what else? Did, oh, um, and you can see it from the, the other side. Um, that's what, sorry, what it, what it indicates is that this big guy is able to gallop, is able to run, because it's got a nice, strong 
um, space for that deltoid to attach, and it's going to be able to really pull that um, humerus forward and let it um, take big strides and gallop. Another local that we have is the elk, Cervus elaphus. Um, similar, um, similar scapula. Um, it's again very pointy down here at the acromion, and a lot uh, more space behind the spine than in front of the spine. Um, but the humerus is pretty different. Um, very smooth. Uh, there's not a lot of um, there's not a lot of prominence on this one. I don't even really couldn't really tell you where the deltoid tuberosity is specifically. Um, it's probably it probably articulates somewhere along here, but um, clearly it's not nearly as important for this animal to be able to move fast. That it doesn't rely on speed and um, running to to uh, get away as much as the bison does. All right, shifting gears to um, some carnivores. Again, this is this, the point of the elbow, and then the humerus is gonna run here to the where you can see the point of the shoulder. That's gonna be that greater tubercle, and then the um, scapula is gonna be here. So the lion um, shoulder blade. Um, what you'll notice is that there's a lot more evenness in front of and behind the spine uh, of the shoulder blade, and that's pretty common in a lot of carnivores. What that allows for is, again, shoulder uh, joint stability, but it allows for stability in impact. So it's going to allow these guys to jump down or hit with their forearms um, a lot harder and, and have that shoulder joint maintain stability. Um, they, the cat, Humeruses look a lot like dog humeruses. Um, they have um, a deltoid tuberosity that you can visualize, but it's not huge. Um, the cool thing about cat humeruses that in researching this presentation, I realized I was misinformed um, as a younger person. But the cool thing about cat humeruses is that they have this structure um, right above their condyle, condyle. It's called the supra above condylar foramen, and foramen is a term for hole in the bone. So they've got this hole in their bone, and very, very, very few other species do. I was taught it was only cats, that if you found a humerus as a hole right here, it's definitely a cat. It's not. But um, it's always on the medial side of the bone, and the medial nerve and um, one of the blood vessels runs through it. Um, so yeah, if, if you find a bone with a hole like that, it's either going to be a cat or it's gonna be a mustelid. So these are uh, wolverines. Um, again, elbow, humerus, point of the shoulder, scapula. Their um, shoulder, or their scapula is gonna look very similar to other carnivores. Um, and their humerus is gonna look very similar to cats and dogs as well. Um, slightly less prominent deltoid tuberosity. Um, but again, very um, smooth, kind of skinny bone and also a super, uh, super condylar foramen. Um, this was a surprise to me, <laughs> but it was another extra credit question on one of my exams. Just supposed to be the cat. All right, big left turn. Um, this is, I believe this is Bodhi. I'm not totally sure, but I'm pretty sure this is Bodhi who lives next door at Denver Zoo. I took this picture of him a few years ago. Um, elephants are really, really different. They are what are called graviportal, which refers to um, their, their body is made up to be able to carry a really heavy weight as they move. Um, so this is the point of his um, elbow. Instead of, the shoulder, or instead of the humerus running this way, his humerus is going to keep running straight up, and the scapula is right above it up here. Um, they have very columnar limbs, very straight up and down to maintain all of that weight and help him get around. Um, this is that scapula. This is that scapula. So after the talk, you guys are welcome to come down and check it out. It's wild. Look at this thing. Um, they have this extra huge process on their acromion, all right? And then again, not so much in front of the spine, but a ton behind the spine. And they even have this roughness here is like just extra space, extra little attachment points for this huge muscle, which indicates how important it is for this shoulder joint to stay stable for this animal. Um, I didn't do very many scale. I didn't do any scale photos because it's the structures that I was focused on. But I had to take a picture with my arm with this thing because it's just bonkers. All right, this is its humerus, also freaking huge. Um, 
I can't pick this thing up by myself. It's gigantic. Um, and what we see is um, they do have a deltoid tuberosity, but with how big that process is on the acromion, you would think that the deltoid tuberosity would be pretty huge, but it's not. It's pretty smooth. Um, it, it's a rough point on the bone, but it's not sticking out very far. Um, and what that really tells us is that this motion in this animal is not the important motion. It's not the advancement of the shoulder that's really important. The other clue that we have is this groove that runs along here. So it comes up and runs along here. That groove is there for the biceps brachii, which you guys, um, <laughs> that's the one everybody's really super familiar with. But um, the biceps crosses from the, um, from this point of the shoulder blade, it's called the glenoid, superglenoid tubercle. Tubercle is yet another term for a bump on a bone. Um, it crosses the joint, runs all the way down the humerus, and attaches to the radius down across the elbow. Um, its main function is to do this, right? Everybody knows. But it also extends the shoulder. Um, so we can see from these structures that this motion is a lot more important for this animal than this motion. Um, and if you've ever seen an elephant walk, you can, you can kind of see that. It's a lot more important for their forward motion for the elbow to be able to bend strongly. All right, next up is Rudy, the black rhino. He lives next door at Areta, Denver Zoo as well. Um, depending on who you talk to, Rhinos are considered graviportal as well, but as we'll see, there's some pretty big differences um, between elephants and rhinos. So this is his, not his, Rudy is still alive and well. Um, <laughs> this is the um, scapula of another black rhino from the Denver Zoo. Um, first thing, first thing that I notice is there's no chromian. Um, it doesn't have it at all, like the kind of like the horse, but it does have this great big bump up here that's even bigger than the horse. It's also a lot more even in front of and behind the spine um, than your typical um, herbivore. And this is its um, humerus. This is my favorite. I love this humerus. It's wild. Um, this is a deltoid tuberosity. Look at this thing. It's like a handle. You can grab it. Um, <laughs> um, but what I want you to really notice, um, this, is, this is flipped from the elephant. So the this is the right, the elephants is the left. But um, that, that big groove for the biceps is on this side. There's a big groove on this one as well that runs underneath the deltoid tuberosity. That's for the brachialis muscle, which is also a flexor of the elbow, but it starts on the humerus instead of on the scapula. So this is still an important movement, but what this giant thing indicates is that the extension or the, the flexion of the shoulder joint is also a really important movement. What this animal can do that the elephant cannot is gallop. Um, and these are the structures that, allows, that allow it to do it. That huge tuberosity on the spine of the scapula, this huge um, tuberosity on the, on the um, humerus allows this animal to gallop where the elephant is not able to. The femur is also really wild on this guy, just so you guys know. All right, um, moving offshore, um, you guys might be familiar with this one. It's a pretty cool, um, it's a pretty cool diorama. We're going to focus on this dude. Um, he's super cute. Um, this is an elephant seal, um, and I think pretty much everybody's familiar with how these guys look when they're not in the water, right? They're going to rely a lot more on muscles that run up and down their body to allow them to move because they kind of do that like worm motion to get around. They do rely on their forelimbs out of the water for some stability, but they're not using those to locomote um, outside of the water. They do use them in the water, um, but again, they're going to use them more for um, for steering than for um, acceleration. So, um, the first thing that you, that I notice about this scapula is how smooth it is. There's not any of the, the ridges and the bumps and stuff. It does have a spine um, that, again, is still pretty flat, and it does have an acromion, but there's not really very many other structures on the scapula that are worth noting. Um, and the same is true for the humerus. It's very stout. Um, it's very smooth. There's not a lot going on. 
but it does have a pretty prominent deltoid tuberosity. It again, it's just kind of like mountains up off this bone. Um, doesn't have a lot of the, the roughness to it, um, but it is pretty large. So it's gonna be important for this animal to flex the, that shoulder joint to be able to move that um, forelimb to steer it through the water. Um, but it's certainly not primarily relying on this bone for locomotion. Um, another water creature, this one, the manatee, does not come out of the water ever. Um, and you can see that in the, sh the structures even better. So very similar to the elephant seal, there's not a whole lot going on on the scapula, it's very smooth. Um, it does have quite, quite a prominent acromion, but other than that, there's not a ton going on with it. And there's even less going on with the humerus. Um, I couldn't tell you where the deltoid tuberosity is on this one. Um, it's kind of an old specimen. I think it's a little bit beat up, but it, it's just a very smooth bone. There's not a lot of um, prominences or roughness to, to observe. So clearly not, um, not a, not a um, limb that's important in locomotion for these guys either. Okay, last but not least, um, this is Mochi. He is um, currently a resident of the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo. Um, he had two friends that um, sadly passed away and came to us in the last couple of years. This is a mountain tapir, um, Tapirus pinchakwe. I'm saying that wrong, but I apologize. Um, this one's cool because I got to help dissect um, both of the previous two that came to the museum. Um, we partnered with a researcher that works at the University of Antwerp in Belgium, and he is looking at the muscle and bone morphology of these guys as an analog for prehistoric tapirs. Um, and so it was a very, very detailed dissection that I got to participate in, which is awesome. It's some of my favorite stuff to do. Um, and we dissected the forelimbs um, of these creatures and then um, took a bunch of measurements. And from that data, he's going to be able to do some reconstruction and modeling. Um, I'm not going to share his research because it's his, but um, I did help clean these bones and became very familiar with them. And um, one of the big takeaways that I took from it is that tapir anatomy is insane. Um, <laughs> so this is the scapula. Again, no acromion, but this large tuberosity. It's pretty even in front of and behind the spine. If you notice this groove here, though, this is super atypical. There was muscle attached to it. Um, and it was very frustrating for us. <laughs> um, but that is that is very really, really atypical. Um, one of the reasons why um, the thought is that they have more evenness here is that these, these creatures live in the rainforest, and so their um, environment is going to require them to sometimes often jump down off of things, and so the, um, the shoulder joint for them is gonna need to be um, stabilized more similarly to like a carnivore than a, than a large herbivore. Um, the other crazy thing is this hole. It's not supposed to be a hole. Um, it's weird in general. Tapirs have a notch right here. So this is supposed to notch, and this is supposed to notch, and there's supposed to be a tendon that crosses it, or a ligament that crosses it. But this one's fully ossified, um, and Dr. Alexander does not know why. <laughs> but both, both of the specimens that we did had that hole. Um, this is the humerus. It's even, it's weird as well, but in the best way. Um, and you can see this is the deltoid tuberosity. So again, fairly prominent deltoid, fairly prominent um, tuberosity on the spine, indicating that um, the, ex the flexion of the shoulder is pretty important in this animal's locomotion. But what you also see is this bump on the other side. This is the teres tuberosity for the teres major um, muscle, which is another muscle of the shoulder that is involved in, let me double check, um, the flexion of the shoulder as well. Um, so, which further indicates the need for this joint to be particularly stable for this animal. Um, not known necessarily for running or galloping, but just another indication that, um, that this animal needs stability in the shoulder joint. So yeah, with that, um, no, I messed it up, sorry. <laughs> um, I just wanna say thank you to everybody for coming and um, thank you to Andy Dahl for helping me with specimens and Andy Carrillo for helping me get ready for this. And yeah, any questions?
I didn't think to look for the cube. Yeah. So uh, I'd like to thank Martha for a humorous, humorous talk. <laughs> a little homonym humor there. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? We have plenty of time. And if the cube exists, can you bring the cube? Questions? Hello, great talk. I can see um, similarities between you and your dad sitting next to me, because he is, hello. Well, he's an engineer, and this is like engineering, but in animals. Structure and function, super cool. So when you um, say that that hole in the um, scapula the tapir there is abnormal, you mean for that species, like just those two individuals had that ossified? Yeah. But it's not supposed to be that way in that no. species. Yeah, it's okay. supposed to be a notch. Weird. Is that a pathology? or? Um, no, we don't think it's a pathology. It, it very well may be an indication of age. They were both pretty old animals. Um, but um, uh, Jamie has dissected several Tapirs, several of them older, and he hadn't seen that before in any of them. So um, the, the theory is that it's a function of age that they ossified as they got older, but we don't really know. Cool. It's Thank weird. you so much. Yeah. Other questions? <laughs> Hi. You mentioned at the start that humans have a slight bump. Hmm? I don't think you got back to that or why that might be. Why? Um, because it, it's mostly because we don't need to, um, we're not bearing weight on this limb when we're moving the deltoid. Um, it's, it's, it's not even super involved in, in lifting when we're lifting heavy loads necessarily. Um, although I'm not somebody that works out, so if there's somebody that lifts weights and <laughs> needs to correct me on that. Um, but, you know, to, to do this motion, um, the, the, the weight of our body is not involved in that, and so the connection to the, to the bone doesn't need to be super gigantic. Um, the, like I said, the, the rhino is my favorite, um, partly because it just really um, well illustrates how that animal is super heavy, and to get it going fast, it needs to be able to just yank on its um, skeletal structure. And so um, all, of those, um, all of those structures in it are just supersized. Um, so that it can get that forward motion that it needs without tearing bone from, or tearing muscle from bone. <laughs> no one? See if I can. So, uh, I want to go back to the superpondular foramen that you mentioned in cats and mustelids. Do you know why cats and mustelids and what the function of that is in both mm -hmm. of them? No. Okay. Um, the, yeah. Um, the, the vessels and the nerves run through it, but in other species that don't have that foramen, the vessels and the nerves run the same area. There's just not a hole for them to go through. So um, let me see if I can find it. So this is the, um, the wolverine, and you can see the hole right here. This is the dog. Um, the the vessels and nerves just run there. They just don't have a hole to go through, so nobody really knows. Um, so it ends up being a fun factoid. And it, it can help when you know, you're out in the woods and you find a bone. Um, if it's got a hole there, you know it's a cat or a weasel. Thank you. Other questions? I do well, have bones down here, so you guys yeah. can come. Go um, browse the, the bones. bones. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll stick around. Thank you very much, Thank Martha. You